Gin is such a massive subject. I knew I was going to need some help, so I've asked along my good pal Trish, uh, who is an expert on this wonderful spirit, to help me have a little chat about all things gin. Honestly, there's so much to talk about and so many amazing new products out there. We've decided to split this across a few different episodes. So today we're gonna to focus on where gin came from and how it evolved into the spirit that we know today. If you're interested in how the different styles of gin compare, then stay tuned for that episode coming up soon. And we'll also have one on the different uses for gin. So if you haven't already, why don't you subscribe and even press the little bell so that you'll get notified when those episodes come out. So I knew Trish was the lady for this job when we were having a training at my work and she was talking about gin and started with, so in the 1500s, uh, <laughs> so what happened in the 1500s that, that started gin off? I actually said in her training, obviously she wasn't paying too much attention. <laughs> it was 1550. BC. <laughs> very, very long-winded story about gin, Kara. <laughs> so why don't we start with the miracle berry itself, known as juniper berry. Basically, it's not a berry at all. It is a female seed cone, part of the conifer family. This miracle berry is a female seed cone, which has a piney resinous sort of aroma to it. So this was used in ancient Egypt for jaundice. It was even used by the ancient Greeks for performance enhancing abilities. <laughs> it was also used by the Dutch for stomach ailments, the Romans for chest ailments, and if you can believe it, even the Black Death in the 1300s, which was one of the world's worst pandemics. They were using juniper infused wines. So gin, juniper, even in its raw estate was used by all humans for thousands of years. In its raw essence, gin essentially is a neutral spirit, kind of like vodka, with the infusion of juniper berries and other botanicals. So it must contain juniper. It should be discernible. <laughs> Isn't in a lot of cases. And other botanicals. Botanicals are Herbs, roots, peels, anything that's natural that grows on its own. It gives it flavor. flavor. Yeah. So how does the flavor from those botanicals get into that neutral spirit? Essentially you get a big kettle. We call that a still. You put your botanicals and juniper into the kettle. You let it heat up and then all the vapors that come out, you trap them and you end up with a flavored distillate. So gin, if it's got juniper in it and other botanicals come through, you condense it and trap it and you've got gin. If you didn't have the juniper in there, it would be a flavored vodka. It really started to take shape and take form in the 1600s. The Dutch started really invigorating this style and where Geneva or Yeneva, and excuse me all the Dutch people out there listening, very crude way of saying it, they used this juniper infused crude spirit which almost is like a hybrid between a gin and a whiskey in flavor. It's a very malty based spirit that use grains of agricultural origin infused with juniper. And still today, it's their national spirit. It is an Appalachian gin as well. So if you think of sparkling wine versus champagne, champagne must be made in that region. It's the same with- You're right, so Geneva has to be made in-, in The Holland. Netherlands, Belgium, and a couple of other places that are pretty small, but mainly still the national drink of Holland. Gin was brought to the rest of the world by King William of Orange, the third king of England. He took his national spirit, Geneva, over to England. And because a lot of the people there couldn't pronounce Geneva. Neither can be fair, but. <laughs> Absolutely. So they shunned it to gin. He didn't so much like the French, and he decided because of the surplus of grain in the UK, that every woman, man, child, and their dog were able to produce gin, which is great because they wanted to obviously ban brandy production. This actually led to what was known as the gin craze, which is a little bit of a dark time in England. So after Geneva, you've got Old Tom Gin. With Old Tom and quite a lot of spirits, you will see cat on the bottle. Old Tom, Old Tom Cat. There are lots of stories with this era, but mainly around the 1700s when they realized that letting everyone make gin wasn't a really good thing. They started to try to impose taxes to stop this from happening as it was really ruining society. 
this term That's was called the whole mother's ruin. Mother's ruin. Thing. Yeah. Exactly. Mother's ruin being, you know, them neglecting their children. So once they started imposing taxes and laws, one of the stories that came out of this was the old Tom gin. So because you were making gins, you'd flavor them with things that made it taste less crude. Because you're like literally making it in your bathtub or your back door or whatever, and so it's just gonna taste like gross. Yeah, methylated spirits, yeah. infusions, anything to kind of sell it to people because that was your main source of income. It was said that an old tomcat fell into a vat of gin. There was another story. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> Are you a cat person? I'm more of a dog person myself, so it doesn't bother me too much. Just kidding. There's another story when, uh, you know, they started imposing taxes uh, and levies and laws to try to eradicate this behavior that a gentleman named Captain Dudley Bradstreet, he was an informant actually. So he was trying to eradicate the competition because he didn't want to pay the 50 pound levy, which I believe is about 8,000 pound today. So a pretty substantial time and they're like, I'm not gonna pay that. So what he did was he made what was called as a puss and mew. So he put a copper cat in a laneway on a door, kind of like a speakeasy style. You would go up and you say, puss. And if he was there, he'd say, no. And you put your money in and out of the cat's paw, out of a lead pipe, you'd get your ration of gin. And so that's my favorite story about old Tom. But basically they were flavored with lots of botanicals to kind of well, that flavor of methylated spirits, uh, the term blind drunk comes from this style of gin because you're quite literally going blind from drinking so much. Does it have sugar in it? Is, is, is it like it's a bit of a sweeter style, hey? So yeah, but at the time, sugar was actually an expensive commodity. Yeah, okay. So what they were doing was they were adding licorice root and other sweet style botanicals to give you this fake sense perception of it being sweeter. Sweetness? Yeah, okay. So that is synonymous with an old Tom style. There are no global regulations on how to make an old Tom, so there will always be different types. And then from there, the, the London Dry kind of evolved out of that. Absolutely. So there are about five gin levies that were major that were imposed to try to stop London falling apart and at the seams, quite yeah. literally. They came out with uh, the London Dry Gin once continuous distillation was invented in the 1830s. And so some brands you might be familiar with are Tanqueray. So Charles Tanqueray, another one might be Gordon's, Alexander Gordon. Very wealthy families that could afford to pay the gin levy. You could afford to procure stills that could make continuous distillation possible and a very premium based spirit. So if it's got London Dry on the bottle, it pays homage to it being of superior quality. It doesn't have to be made in London. It just has to use all fresh botanicals distilled together, a minimum of 37.5% alcohol by volume and a very premium base spirit. So that is a London dry. And that's when it started to turn for the better. So at that point that, you know, they're not needing to mask the actual base spirit because that's actually good quality. So for instance, like Tanqueray only has four botanicals in it, right? And, you know, so they're not doing the same thing where they do that they do with Old Tom. So they were just like cram as much stuff in as possible <laughs> so that you can't actually taste exactly. anything. Um, and then that that was kind of the, the style of gin that I guess got us through most of the 20th century, really. Most of my last eight or nine years. <laughs> <laughs> I love London Dry. Uh, and now we're kind of in a in a bit of a new era. How do you feel about that? This is a little bit controversial. I don't know if you wanna if you wanna explain that because gin doesn't actually have a very solid definition, so people are kind of definitely taking it, like sort of interpreting it to quite long lengths at this point. Really the only um, thing that's legislated about gin is that it has to have juniper as a primary flavor. But you're absolutely right. So you've got like uh, these gins that use New World uh, botanicals, New World ingredients. I guess some of those came about because the gin category kind of evaporated for vodka. Uh, prohibition, this is in the 1920s, for about 13 years. And so gin became kind of crude again. So by 1933, gin, was almost completely extinguished due to the fact that you couldn't get anything of high quality. It was back to those bathtub gins, those crude old Tom styles, you know, that made your hair stand on edge. So like, obviously that's happening in America, but in the UK they were still making, like it's never really died out in the UK as much, has it? Not so um, much. But it just kind of went a little bit out of fashion because I guess where America goes, the rest of the world 
Well, those are at least at that point. Absolutely. Nowadays, gin producers did this wonderful thing. Uh, notably, one of them is Hendrix. They took a lighter style of gin infused with cucumber and rose to bring people back to the category. Like, you don't have to be afraid anymore. It's not something for your grandmother to drink alone. It's not going to be that really piney, resinous, yeah, sort of, uh, yeah like off particular. Turpentine and all, yeah. all these other things that scared people away. It's coming back with really loud other flavors because gin is so diversified as a category. Like, there really isn't a wrong now, which I think I'm really enjoying. Yeah. Because you can use really interesting botanicals, and I think Australia is a really good example. Yeah. Of the gin category, booming. This one literally has a uh, has ants in it. I don't know if you can get a close up later, um, which is obviously something that Indigenous Australians have been eating for a really long time and has like a really kind of lime and coriander flavour going on in there. But that's kind of an example of the fun stuff that people are doing now. Also, because you know, you know, there's so many gins on the market that I guess you need to differentiate yourself in, in some way and be like, you know, the one that people remember because there's ants in the bottle, which is clever. Like, Whatever it takes, yeah. really. <laughs> it's, it's gone from being, I guess, quite a, a simple sort of... Simple and stifled as well. Yeah. To being this <laughs> rainbow of whatever you want. It's like putting your dreams into a bottle at the end of the day, really, <laughs> and using things that are around you, which is super special and super unique. And uh, I love the diversity and seeing where it's going. It's amazing. So that was a pretty awesome insight into the history of gin. I certainly learned some stuff that I didn't know before. And I think it's good to get an understanding of how we've arrived at having the amazing range of products that we now have available to us. As I said at the beginning, we've got some more gin talk coming up soon. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Uh, we've also got some more great gin talk in our Negroni and London Calling episodes, so be sure to check those out. So now you know.